you all. Good morning. Good morning. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Al Smith, which is a name that's easy to remember and I hope hard to forget. <laughs> I want to welcome you all to our tour of the GAR Hall here in Lynn, Massachusetts, your hometown. There's so many things here to see, and I hope you'll all enjoy it. Um, my talk this morning is based upon something that when I was your age, which is what, 15, 16 years old, I became interested in the Civil War. But soon afterwards, I became more interested in a specific part of the Civil War, and that was about Abraham Lincoln, the 16th President of the United States. One thing that I could probably ask Mr. Paulin about is, when I was at your age, there were a couple of things that we were required to memorize in school. First and foremost, we were all required to memorize the Gettysburg Address. And I don't know if they do that now, but hopefully someday they will. So what I would like to do is to keep you attuned to what the Gettysburg Address was all about, and kind of tear it apart a little bit. It was authored by a man that's, if he were, Abraham Lincoln, if he was standing here before you now, he would be in awe of what he sees. Now many of you say, huh? Why would he be in awe of me? I'm just sitting here. The one thing that I've learned about Abraham Lincoln was his greatness was based upon all he possessed was the education of a first grade student. He would be standing here in front of you now, and he would see that all of you have attained at least 10 years of education, with two more to go. And many of you will go on to further education by going to a college or a university. And he would be amazed at the capabilities that you possess for your future life. Remember, he only had the education of a first grade student, and he would attain the position, the highest position in the land, President of the United States, and subsequently he would be the author of some of the greatest documents that our American history possesses. Not only the Constitution or the Declaration of Independence, but he would be the author of the Emancipation Proclamation. He would be the author of the Gettysburg Address. He would be the author of the Second Inaugural Speech when he was elected for the second time. So today I would like to take you to a portion of one of the documents that he was author of, which was the Gettysburg Address. So I would like to begin by giving you a little background information about Gettysburg, the Battle of Gettysburg. How many of you heard about the Battle of Gettysburg? So you are familiar that Gettysburg was a big battle in the Civil War. So let's start off, and then we'll take it to, I'll, I'll conclude by kind of tearing apart the Gettysburg Address, which I hope will show you the greatness the, magnificent, the magnificence of that document. It was in the aftermath of the Battle of Gettysburg, both sides leaving 50,000 dead. The accurate figure was 53,000. The total de death uh, and injured and missing was 750,000. More men were lost from the Civil War than all the wars combined since World War I, World War II, Korea, Vietnam, and such. 50,000 dead, wounded, or missing behind them. The residents of Gettysburg had little reason to be satisfied with the war that, they ch that had churned up their lives. Through all the missed chances, senseless deaths, missed opportunities, would give rise to a symbol of national purpose, pride, and ideals. Abraham Lincoln transformed the ugly reality into something rich and strange, and he did it with 272 words. Ten sentences. The power of the words has really been given a more compelling demonstration. The village leaders had uh, decided that it was necessary to have a consecration of a national cemetery in, in Pennsylvania. So Pennsylvania Governor uh, Curtin would ask David Wills, a local Gettysburg attorney, to organize the plans to put into action the dedication of such a cemetery. Wills felt the need for Arthur words to sweeten the poisoned air of Gettysburg. Wills will ask the notable poets of his time, which was Longfellow, Whittier, and Bryant, to join him in this effort. All would refuse. 
in honor of being the main speaker, the honor of being the main speaker was given to Edward Everett, a Massachusetts boy. Everett would be the speaker, the main speaker, and he would give a talk that would last over 13,000 words. Lincoln was 272. So you see the comparison. His talk was the kind of speech that would, have, would be expected of such an occasion. Everett Everett was a great American statesman and orator from Massachusetts, and would later write to Mr. Lincoln, I should be glad if I could flatter myself that I came to the central idea of the occasion in two hours as you did in two minutes. It is worthy to note of the strong feelings that Massachusetts had for Mr. Lincoln and the Civil War, as exhibited by the words of Charles Sumner and Edward Everett, and on June 1st of 1865, Senator Sumner commented on what is now considered the most famous speech by President Lincoln. In his eulogy on the slain president, he called it a monumental act. He said that Lincoln was mistaken, that there was a world that will little note nor long remember what he say here. Rather, the Bostonian remarked, the world noted at once what he said and will never cease to remember the, the speech. The battle itself was less important than the speech. It is worthy to note that the strong feeling that Massachusetts has for Mr. Lincoln and the Civil War as exhibited by the words of Charles Sumner and Everett Everett. The words spoken at Gettysburg are some of the most beautiful words ever spoken, but also offered a, a, an eloquent tr a tribute to the soldier heroes who died so that this nation might live. But it also told America that it must now be dedicated to the new birth of freedom, that it would guarantee equality and justice for all, and Mr. Lincoln's belief was that this freedom was worth fighting for and even to die for. Abraham Lincoln must be credited with not only writing the poetry of the Gettysburg Address, but also the legality of the Emancipation Proclamation. You've all heard of that, have you? Yeah. What did it do? Someone? Mr. Paul, we're gonna have a test, where are you? We're gonna have a test there today? The Emancipation Proclamation did what? In the in the states that were controlled by military forces. These two, in the Emancipation Pro these two documents will stand for all time in our American history. A review of certain phrases in the Gettysburg Address will explain why Mr. Lincoln used them. In order to accomplish this purpose, it is important to enter into the mind of Mr. Lincoln when he composed the Gettysburg Address. Mr. Lincoln's mindset was he not only wanted to make a political statement, but he wanted to make known of the belief in the equality of all men. The victory at Gettysburg was a positive political victory towards emancipation, but it also absolved him from any northern opposition toward the, towards the uh, consequences of the war. The sadness of the event left questions in his heart as how many me more men had to die in order to protect the living. And because of this, thought he wanted the thoughts to be spoken in just the right way. His message had to be that the soldiers did not die in vain, that they knew what they were fighting for, and that the soldiers' efforts had to be a commemoration of, of, of their efforts. He knew that he wanted to say, but as putting a pen to paper, he still didn't have it right. Lincoln gets his inspiration from the men who fought, and he does not want to fail them, and would rely on the direct source of beliefs. One thing I've learned about Mr. Lincoln was anything he wrote, he took his time being a lawyer. So some of you want to be a lawyer, you may learn his, his habit. He wanted to be very specific in the words he chose. And I'll show you, I'll demonstrate some of the, the phrases. The Declaration of Independence, and I quote from the opening lines from both the Declaration of Independence and the Gettysburg Address, that shows that both documents possess the same inspiration. The Declaration of Independence opens with, when in the course of human events, it becomes necessary for one people to dissolve the political bands which have connected them and to another to assume among the powers of the earth that separate and equal station to which the laws of nature and of nature's God entitled. A decent respect to the opinions of the mankind require that it should declare that the causes which impel them to separation. We hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Now the Gettysburg Address uh, 
There are five authenticated copies of the Gettysburg Address. There are two that claim to be authentic, but it is believed that they're just news, uh, newspaper reporters' versions of the Gettysburg Address. And the five are called the uh, Hay copy, which was given to John Hay, uh, Lincoln's was secretary. John Nicolay, which was another of his secretaries. The Everett copy, which was given to Everett Everett, the main speaker. The Bancroft copy, which was, he was a local historian. And finally, the Bliss copy. And the Bliss copy is considered the most important, or the most authentic copy, because it has Abraham Lincoln's signature on it, where the other four do not have it. Now, the <coughs> words, let's dissect the words to see the beauty of what Mr. Lincoln was attempting to do. Opening lines, four score and seven years ago, our fathers brought forth on this nation uh, and on this continent a new nation, conceived in liberty and dedicated to the proposition that all men are created equal. Now let's kind of tear these apart. Why did he use the words four score and seven? Because it was 47 years ago. 47 years ago. 40, 47? Yeah, isn't that right? Ah, close. It was 87 years ago. 87 years ago. <laughs> Go talk to this one. 87 years ago is four score and seven. So four score and seven is much more poetic, much more elegant, much more noble than 87. And if you subtract 87 from 1863, voila, you get 1776, which we all know to be the Revolutionary War. OK, all right. We're making progress, Mr. Paul. This is fitting because 87 years earlier, the United States had won its freedom from Britain, thus embarking on the great experiment of the time. Lincoln reminds the audience of the basis on which this country was founded, liberty and equality. And this is a perfect setup for the next sentence. Now we are engaged in a great civil war, testing whether that nation or any nation so conceived and de so dedicated can long endure. Lincoln signals the challenge. The principles on which the nation was founded are under attack. He extends the significance of the fight beyond the borders of the United States. It is not just a question of whether America could survive, but rather the question of whether any nation founded on the same principles could survive. Thus does the war and the importance of winning it take on a greater significance. The next sentence is, we are met on a great battlefield of that war. We have come to dedicate a portion of that field as a final resting place for those who were here gave their lives that this nation might live. It is altogether fitting and proper that we should do so. We decipher what he wants to say. Lincoln turns to, to recognize those who have fallen for their country. He uses contrast effectively by stating those who here gave their lives that this <clears throat> nation might live. Lincoln makes what is perhaps the ultimate contrast, life versus death. Contrast is a very compelling feeling. He uses consonants and repetition as the same consonant in the short succession through words with the letter F, battlefield, uh, field, for, uh, final, fitting, so using those words. Next, but in a larger sense, we cannot dedicate, we cannot consecrate, we cannot hallow this ground. Notice the use of the triple. Cannot dedicate, cannot consecrate, cannot hallow. Triples are a powerful public speaking technique that can add power to your words and make them memorable. The brave men living and dead who struggled here have, have consecrated it far above our power to add or detract. This, this sentence is full of solemn respect for those who fought it. It is an elegant way of saying that their actions speak louder than Lincoln's words. The world will little note, no longer remember what we say here, but it can never forget what they did here. There is a double contrast in this sentence. The world will little note, no longer remember, 
what we say here, but I cannot forget what they did here. Note the appeal to something larger. It is not the United States that we'll never forget, but the entire world. Ironically, Lincoln was wrong on this point. Not only have his words been remembered to this day, they will continue to be remembered for the future. It is for us, the living, rather to be dedicated here to the unfinished work for which they fought here and have thus far so nobly advanced. It is rather for us to be here dedicated to that great task remaining before us that from these honored dead we take increased devotion to the cause for which they gave their last full measure of devotion. That, that we here re highly resolve that these dead shall not have died in vain, that this nation under God shall have a new birth of freedom and that the government of the people, by the people, for the people, shall not perish from the earth. The final two sentences of the address sound like a call to action, a resolve to complete the unfinished work. They are full of inspirational words which are dedicated nobly, great, honored devotion, highly resolved, God, birth, and freedom. There are a couple of contrasts in the living with the honored dead, and these dead shall not have died in vain with this nation, shall have a new birth of freedom. Earlier, Lincoln said that in a sense, they could not dedicate this ground here. He tells the audience that to which they must be dedicated the unfinished work and to the great task remaining before them. He finishes with a powerful triple that has become famous throughout the world, of the people, and by the people, and for the people. So that's my little talk for today. I hope that you will take these words of Abraham Lincoln and put them up in your memory banks and say, you know, he was quite a guy. He was quite a guy that he would be able to compose these wonderful, exciting, magnificent words. Thank you. before me because I want to begin with the Emancipation Proclamation. I'm Joseph Zellner and I reenact a member of the 54th Massachusetts Volunteer Infantry Regiment, member of Company A by the name of Solomon Pierce. My applause to you for standing. It's time. The character I reenact is Solomon Pierce. Solomon Pierce was 42 years old when he joined the military. Now you may want to think, 42? People joined the military in their 20s. What is this man doing at 42 years of age joining the military? Solomon Pierce was one of those 200,000 African Americans who will join the federal forces in both the Army and the Navy to fight for the federal army in the Civil War. I'll get back to Solomon momentarily. I think that if you think about the cause of the war, historians and citizens thereof, historians will argue about just about anything. They will argue, a debate, and challenge one another as to the cause of the war. Without answering out loud, think about, if you were to ask the question, what was the cause of the Civil War? Think about what you would answer. Within your answer, I hope you would say, the Civil War was caused by slavery in the United States. I want to ask you one more question. Think about, if slavery had been eliminated, during the American Revolution, as it was in many states, many colonies at that time, several colonies will eliminate slavery during the Revolution or shortly thereafter. If slavery had been eliminated, let's say in um, 1783, when the war ends, if slavery had been eliminated in 1783, would a civil war have been fought in 1861? 
Well, Solomon Pierce was one of those 200,000 men who will join the federal forces, and he will join at the age of 42. A little bit about myself. Uh, as a reenactor, my interest in history uh, developed uh, probably in high school. Uh, it was an easy subject for me. I found that my peers either loved history or hated history. You may have that same experience. You either love it or hate it. Oh, no, I've got to go to that class. Or, oh, yeah, yeah, let's go to history class. Very few people who are on the fence about, eh, I don't know, take it or leave it. They either leave it or they take it. They don't find themselves neutral about it. My interest in the Civil War, perhaps it, was, it is like yours. Yes, it's probably the greatest war that the Americans ever fought. And when I say Americans, I mean people of the United States. It's probably the greatest war that the Americans ever fought. The effect of the war will decide whether or not this nation would long endure half slave and half free. Another quote from Mr. Lincoln that you just heard, that the nation cannot endure with half of the states allowing slavery to exist and half of the slavery, it will either become all one or all the other. In 1863, this is the year of the Emancipation Proclamation. In that proclamation, Lincoln provides for the arming of black regiments. Up until that time, black regiments were not recognized in the United States military. But keep in mind, black soldiers had fought in all of US wars. Even going back to the colonial time, go back to the French and Indian War, black men fought in those wars. So black men had fought in all of America's wars, even though they had not been officially recognized as fighting in America's wars. It's not until 1863 that Lincoln's Emancipation Proclamation authorizes the recruitment of black soldiers. Now, one of the things that that provides is it recognizes, and I'll borrow a line from the film Glory, if you've seen that, it recognizes that black men can fight just as well as white men. It hasn't been proven yet because they have not been tried in battle. But it does recognize that yes, and barring a line from the movie, a black man can stop a bullet just as good as a white man. Now, in 1861, the war begins. 1863, black soldiers are authorized to fight, and it is Massachusetts. I've always been intrigued. I'm not from Massachusetts. I'm from uh, New Jersey. And I was quite intrigued when we first came up here. Um, don't blame me, I'm from Massachusetts. You may not remember what that comes from. Ask your parents or grandparents, what did it mean when bumper stickers, signs, prominently announced, don't blame me, I'm from Massachusetts. When I came up here, that, I could see that sign on lots of cars and sort of stuck on billboards. Uh, and I was intrigued by the fact that Massachusetts has commonly been on what people call the right side of history. That Massachusetts has done the right thing before other states followed and did the right thing. Massachusetts has a long history in being in the forefront of correcting the ills of our country, I'll say. So when Massachusetts authorizes the, raise, the raising of a black regiment, they want to recruit a thousand men, a regiment is a thousand men, from Massachusetts citizens to join this regiment to go fight in the Civil War. Massachusetts does not have a thousand black men, because that would be a thousand free men, to go fight in the military. But men come from virtually every state of the Union, some from Canada, some are escaped from slavery in the South, and join Massachusetts Regiment, the 54th, in 1863. In fact, recruitment is so successful that Massachusetts also establishes a 55th Regiment, 
another 1,000 men, and they established a 5th Cavalry Regiment, horse soldiers, of about 800 men. By the time Massachusetts gets its regiment started, New York, Connecticut, Pennsylvania, all begin to do the right thing and establish black regiments in their own states. A distinction between black soldiers and white soldiers was maintained. These were segregated regiments. They weren't fighting side by side, literally. But black regiments and white regiments did fight in the same battles against the Confederacy, but they were not integrated troops. My character, Solomon Pierce, comes to Boston in December of 1863. And when I say Boston, I should say Reedville. Anyone know where Reedville, Massachusetts is? No. It's about as far out of Boston as you can be and yet still be within the city limits. It's way down on the Dedham border, the opposite side of the city from Lynn here. But Solomon Pierce will come to Reedville, Massachusetts in 1863, volunteer his services. He brings his son, 19-year-old Warren Pierce, with him. Those two men sign up for volunteer in the regiment. Now, if you've seen the film or know your history about the regiment, let me give you a little bit of information. The regiment is formed in February and March of 1863. They ship out of Boston in May of 1863. They fight their first major battle in July of 1863. How many people have seen Glory? Yes? OK. Where is that first major battle fought? Someone? Anyone? South Carolina, more specifically? No, Antenna is in Maryland. But it's South Carolina in Charleston and, and at the fort, and the crowd all said, Wagner, Fort Wagner, OK? So they're fighting in Fort Wagner. Now, Fort Wagner protects Fort Sumter. What happened at Fort Sumter? Correct. And do they succeed? Yes. The South fires on Fort Wagner and, excuse me, the South fires on Fort Sumter and the commander Colonel Robinson, I believe, or Roberts, surrenders the fort. The South does take it from the Federal Army. But in 1863, the 54th Massachusetts, it's given its first major engagement to attack Fort Wagner and try to capture that fort so that they can then attack Fort Sumter and then attack the city of Charleston. Now, to make this a little bit like home, Charleston Harbor is quite similar to Boston Harbor. A lot of islands in Boston Harbor, yes? You've probably taken a visit there. Similarly with Charleston, a lot of islands in Charleston Harbor. Fort Sumter in Charleston Harbor sits on one of those islands. Fort Wagner, a little bit further out to sea, sits on one of those islands. Anyone ever been out to Fort Warren on George's Island? No? I encourage you to take a, a, a uh, a shuttle, a water taxi out there sometime this summer. But Fort Wagner protects Fort Sumter, Fort Sumter protects Charleston. Now there are other forts around the harbor also, but those two, Sumter and Wagner, are the ones we'll talk about. My character, Solomon Pierce, joins in December of 1863. The Battle at Fort Wagner had already been fought in July of 1863. Solomon Pierce's relationship to the Battle of Fort Wagner is that his oldest son, now keep in mind I said his second, his son Warren and he joined in December, his oldest son Harrison joins the regiment in March of 1863. Harrison is in that attack on Fort Wagner and in fact is killed in that assault. Now, Word comes home in August, my oldest son has been killed. Harrison Pierce has been killed. 
Mother and father out in Munson, Massachusetts, where the family lives. Munson is, oh, 65 miles west. You know where Palmer, Massachusetts is? Okay, Palmer, do you know where? Uh, exit 9, where you go, <coughs> excuse me, go south. But in case, gotta get a little drink here. <coughs> <laughs> in any case, Solomon gets the word that his oldest son has died in August of 1863, and by December of 1863, he has made the decision that he and his second son will come and join the regiment. Now, as, as an interpreter of Solomon's actions, I really don't have any idea of why he, at 42 years old, would take his second son, after their first son has already been killed in battle, would take himself and his second son, come to Reedville, and volunteer and join the regiment. Solomon was not a slave. His son was not enslaved. Solomon was born free in, Mass in Connecticut. His sons were born free in Massachusetts. They live in Massachusetts. He's a free man. Why does he run the risk, and it's a real risk because his oldest son has already been killed, why does he run the risk and join the 54th Mass? I can only guess. Think about the debate, the discussion, the crying, the tears between his wife, Fanny, and himself when he comes and says to her, I'm going to go join the regiment. I'm going to take Warren with me. Fanny, what are you doing? You've already given one son. Now, you're going to go take yourself and get killed and take my second son? No, you're not going to do it. There must have been some argument between August when they find out that Harrison is dead and December when father and second son leave and go off and join the regiment. In any case, they do, he does that. And when I interpret Solomon in the first person, I'm just telling you about him now. Other times I pretend to be him, and I try to discuss that issue, because keep in mind, from March of 1863 to August of 1864, the regiment is not being paid. They are not getting their salary. They're not getting their $13 a month. They will go for about 18 months without pay. They fight the battle, men get killed, the politicians are debating, how much are we going to pay these men? $13 a month or $10 a month? $13, no, they're black soldiers. They don't deserve as much as white soldiers. And the debate goes back and forth. A black soldier can stop a bullet just as good as a white soldier. And for less money, too. So that argument is thrown up. When you take father and second son, who's going to take care of the household and the farm? Who's going to feed us? Well, it has to be the women, the wife, and in this case, literally the women, because the other child left at home was a daughter, nine-year-old daughter. And what we also learn when we look at the record, that in August of 1864, Fanny gives birth to a new child, Lorenzo, is his name that they named him. So the speculation goes, whose child is this? Husband has been off at war. But if you do the math, it's probably Solomon's child. But in any case, the war ends. Solomon and second son survived the war. And I'm here to tell his story. He will die in 1896. He is buried in Munson, Massachusetts. He's buried in a GAR, a Grand Army of the Republic, plot in the Hillcrest Cemetery. His headstone is there. His GAR medallion is there. His nephew will also survive the war. His second son survives the war. I have no idea where his second son is buried, but his nephew, James Wallace, his nephew, which is his sister's son, who goes off and joins the regiment with his old with. Solomon's oldest son, Harrison, will uh, be buried in that same plot. Uh, I can't give you his 
death date. But Harrison is a veteran of the war. He is one of more than 200,000 black soldiers and sailors who will serve in the Federal Army in 1861 and 1863. When the war is over, the men are discharged out on Gallup's Island, one of the islands in the Boston Harbor. They sail back to Boston. They are quarantined on Gallup's Island for a few days, and then they are free to go home. Solomon goes back to Muncie. We have here all of these pictures of members of this G.A.R. Hall, among whom we have pictures of three, and we know that four black veterans of the 54th Massachusetts Regiment, three of them joined this hall, and a fourth member lived in Lynn, but was not a member of this G.A.R. Hall. So I'm well pleased to represent Solomon. I thought many years ago that although I'm not 42, I could portray a 42-year-old. Uh, Solomon will ever remain 42 years old during the war. Unfortunately, I age. And if I look 42 to you, thank you. A um, little bit about the uniform. This is the uniform that federal troops were issued. In the beginning of the war, state troops sent their volunteer militias. And it took a while for the Federal Army, as well as for the Confederate Army, to get uniform in their uniform. The typical Federal Army uniform was this navy blue. This is a frock coat. Uh, a shorter length coat is a sack coat. They were given sky blue trousers. They were given these brogans, also known as Jefferson booties, designed by Thomas Jefferson. I know you have a famous uh, Jan Matzeliger, if I'm pronouncing his name correctly, here in Lynn, who revolutionized the shoe industry here in this town. Don't know about him? Shame on you. Shame on you. But none, nonetheless, these shoes became common footwear for all of federal troops. Under here I have some leggings, because these are wool, and uh, they're not very comfortable. You just let them wear, rub against your skin. I have uh, this haversack in which I would keep my personal items, but I would also keep food and rations in here. Um, if I were on the march, I have a waist belt which holds my bayonet and my cap box for firing my rifle. Here I have my cartridge box which holds paper cartridges. In here you would have a lead bullet, black powder, and this cartridge is what you would use to load your weapon with. On my head I have a kepi. These were of various designs depending on which state and uh, at what time in the war and which manufacturer made them. It may be a little bit different. And on top of this I have my symbol of the bugle. This is a, uh, looks more like a French horn, I guess, a modern day French horn. And a 54, which represents the regiment, the 54th Regiment from Massachusetts. And I have a symbol, a letter A, which tells you the company that I belong to. Now, if I didn't lose this cap in the course of a battle, this would be basically the thing that would be used to identify who I was. It wouldn't tell, you, wouldn't tell you your name, so quite often when going into battle, soldiers would write their name on a piece of cloth and pin it to their uniform so that if they didn't survive, when the grave diggers came through, they would know what, which body it is. Now, quite common, more people were known as unknown rather than having their name somewhere attached. One more identification element that the Federal Army developed were core badges. The Army is divided into the Army, the big overall umbrella, then there are corps, then there are battalions, then there are divisions, regiments, companies, and then individual troops within the company. So this is identification. Later on, the Army will adopt what we call dog tags, and each soldier puts that around his neck so that if they die in battle, 
their dog tag can be used to identify them. The most significant aspect of the soldier's uniform is his weapon. This is a, a reproduction of a British-made weapon. It is a infield 58 caliber. It fires a round, a bullet, which is about twice the size of a nine millimeter slug in today's wet weapons. Uh, it's probably four or five times bigger than a 223, uh, which is commonly used in modern military weapons. But it only fires one bullet at a time. It only fires one bullet at a time. And the loading process probably takes about 20 seconds, if you're good. And if you don't get hit by another bullet that the other guy is shooting at you. But this infield was issued to 54th Massachusetts. It's a British made weapon because Springfield Armory, if you've ever been out to Springfield, Massachusetts, was the armorer for the federal military, but they could not produce weapons fast enough. So the United States and the Confederate States imported weapons from the British. Um, war produces a lot of opportunists, and people who want to sell you weapons are quite willing to. Um, it provides them money, but it also instills death among you, the soldiers. So, for my character, Solomon Pierce, for the uniform of the 54th Mass, I thank you for listening. And if you have questions, take a moment and I'll respond. Thank you. First of all, Thanks for coming up. And good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. My name is Charles W. Lewis. I am a Southerner. I was born in Mobile, Alabama in the early 1940s. My great grandfather was on Jefferson Davis Plantation. It was in Briarfield, Mississippi. Because my I got interested in the Civil War when my grandmother would regale me with stories about my uh, great grandfather who ran away from the plantation to join the Union Army at that time. At that time, the Battle of uh, Shiloh, that was in the uh, state of Tennessee. And he uh, ran and just fought, was fortunate enough, he didn't get caught, he went into a Union camp. And he was what they called in those days, I think about 12 years old, a camp, uh, the eight. He uh, served the Union troops. And it just so, uh, it was a uh, Union soldier, I think from the state of Maine, took him on his wing, and that's how, and he took the uh, soldier's name, which was Lewis, which is uh, my last name. And I think uh, my father was related to the last surviving slave uh, in America is uh, in a Plateau, Alabama. Right now the town is called Africatown, Alabama. It was Cujo Lewis. He was the last surviving slave at that time. When I was in the state of Alabama, I went to high school, graduated in 1961. I noticed these, uh, in my uh, history class, the Civil War was just one-sided. I knew more about uh, Jefferson Davis, Robert E. Lee, Stonewall, Jackson, and a few other Union generals, and they, they sort of downplayed the Union role, at least down there, because if you uh, look at the Alabama uh, educational system, uh, it was kind of more or less, uh, we were programmed to look at the South side, and I knew absolutely nothing about uh, uh, African American participation in the Civil War. In fact, I was, we were told that they didn't even participate at all. And, when I came to Boston in 1962, uh, I was stunned from my uncle to take me to the State House and saw a plaque of the 54th Regiment. 
it was then that I really uh, got involved in the Civil War. Uh, right now, I belong to Sons of Union Veterans of the Civil War, which I have been for the past five years. I've attended uh, battlefields in Antietam, uh, the uh, crater in uh, Petersburg, Virginia, and Antietam. In fact, the name Antietam was mentioned uh, when the first speaker, Mr. Smith, mentioned the uh, uh, Emancipation Proclamation. If you remember that battle, uh, Charlesburg and Antietam, President Lincoln, before he, he uh, he needed a military victory, which was given here to him, uh, which was uh, performed by the Union troops at uh, Antietam in uh, 1862. If you remember, the Battle of Antietam was uh, the bloodiest day in American history. Like 17,000 troops on both sides killed, wounded, and missing. I mention that because uh, the soldier that lived in Lynn, John G. B. Adams, participated in that battle. He also participated during uh, the 19th uh, Massachusetts uh, Infantry Regiment. From the, uh, he was born in Groveland, Massachusetts, where he spent the rest of his life in the city of, uh, of Lynn. He's also one of the uh, 18 people of the recipient of, of the uh, Army's uh, Medal of Honor. That's the award to a soldier for outstanding performance, the highest medal that you can uh, receive. Uh, however, he participated in the Battle of uh, Fredericksburg, where he was, uh, that's what uh, his, his performance of duty earned him the, Met, uh, the Medal of Honor, but he also participated in uh, Fredericksburg, I mean, that Fredericksburg I just mentioned, but Chancellorville, Gaddisburg, and he was wounded in 1864, the bloodiest battle of the Civil War in the wilderness, uh, Spotsylvania, in Cold Harbor, where he was captured for nine months. If you remember Cold Harbor, that was one of the bloodiest battles because the Union Army on the General Grant lost 7,000 men in 20 minutes. And that's why John G.B. Adams was captured. He, he served in uh, three prisons back in those uh, in the, during the Civil War, especially as you were, you know, in the Southern states, like the worst prison was in uh, Andersonville, which was near Augusta, Georgia, where he was fortunate uh, to serve in uh, South Carolina in Richmond. And at the time when they released him, the Union Army was gaining in 18, late 1864, uh, uh, after uh, the Battle of Mobile Bay, when the Union Army was on the rise, and General Sherman demolished Georgia. He was uh, at a, a prison in Macon, Georgia, so he didn't suffer that much. If you're in any uh, prison, whether it's north, south, east, or west, you are the prisoners experience man's inhumanity to man, because that is uh, it's the worst of human nature. But he was very, very lucky. Again, he also served in, uh, in Gettysburg. So those, those, those were the bloodiest battles of the war. John J.B. Adams, what we call, what I would call an unsung hero. Like I say, again, he lived in the city of Lynn, and after the war, of course, Lynn at that time had a lot of shoe factories, that's why he was employed at. Also, he was a custom agent in the city of Boston. He was the commander of uh, Camp Lander for a number of years here in the city of Lynn. Also, Captain Lander was instrumental in creating a home for soldiers. To this day, it's called the Chelsea Soldiers' Home. It's right in Chelsea where I reside at. And in 2015, June 25th, we had a ceremony honoring John G. B. Adams, and we have a building that's named special in his honor. If you can remember, if you are aware, the soldier's home was uh, erected in 1882. And again, John Adams was instrumental. The soldier's home there in Chelsea has been there for 1882. 
and we're going to have a ceremony for you honoring the 137th year. If you look at the city of Lynn and all the pictures on the wall, there's a lot of heroes, <coughs> unsung heroes. And Captain John G. B. Adam is among them. Got a photo of him over here, and the one is over there. If you, you perhaps have already seen. The city of Lynn should be very proud to have us. They were very pivotal in the Civil War. As I said before, I never would have known it had not come to Massachusetts. And uh, my friend from the uh, fifth book of uh, Redmond, Massachusetts has always been in the fourth month. And I have lived here since 1962. And I was glad to serve what I did in, in Vietnam for the uh, U.S. Army from Massachusetts. Thank you very much. Thank you. talking about uh, John uh, G.B. Adams. Uh, the G.B. is Gregory and the B. is for Bishop, no relation to me. Uh, but there's a young lady here from the Lynn Historical Society who has something that she would like to show you. If you'd like to come on over. And this is a medal that belonged to uh, Captain, actually, uh, he liked to be called Captain Adams. They offered him a colonelcy and all that stuff. Now that, that medal indicates that he was a commander here in this post. He was a commander of the Department of Revenue, uh, Revenue, yeah, that's where I used to work. The Department of Massachusetts, Sons of Union, or, or Grand Army of the Republic, and nationally, he was a national commander uh, at the Grand Army of the Republic. So that particular medal is something that's priceless and something that we would love to have here in this hall but unfortunately we don't. So, you get a chance to look at that, and Mine. then we'll go from there. Now, while she's showing that, uh, I'm looking for, what time is it? Okay, we got a few minutes, which I'll, I'll talk about General Lander. Yes. We didn't get to show these, I'm going to show them now. See these three gentlemen? You all saw the movie Glory, right? Yes. All right. Two of these guys were at the original battle, not the one in the movies. These are three men that were members of this post who were members of the 54th Regiment. And they served during the same time that that battle took place. So they were either at the battle itself or back in camp uh, on other duties. But two thirds of the regiment attacked Fort Wagner. So you, you've all seen that movie, so you get a sense. And these guys were there, they did the fighting, and they lived to come home and be here in Lynn and end up their picture on this wall as they were active members of this post. Charlie talked about one of them who actually was over at the soldier's home when uh, he passed away. And he was buried from his home on Boston Street. So you all know these guys. It's, it's an amazing thing to see this. So when we're done, if you want to take a chance, We'll have it over there, you take a look at it, and you read a little bit about what they were doing, okay? Now,
This yeah. hair in this room is like drying my throat. <laughs> You learn something every day, and I have to say that I certainly have. The, if I can make this work, you guys I'm sure feel very comfortable with these things, but I don't. And there it is, okay. General Landa, you can't see it because you're not there. Well, up there is a picture of General Lander. And I have to say, I'm willing to bet there's not one person in here who could say what General Lander did in his lifetime. Anybody got a guess? Yeah, he joined the Army. But before the Army, he was a surveyor. And he was surveying for the government. For the, uh, on the, uh, yeah, for the railroads on the West Coast. And he also surveyed the Oregon Trail. Now, how many of you have heard of the Oregon Trail? Some of you have heard, some haven't. Well, you have to. Uh oh. So you got to listen. You got the teacher back there. You got to come back there. Yes. Well, if you've heard of the Oregon Trail, General, uh, actually at the time he was a lieutenant colonel, uh, he went and took 200 miles off that uh, trail by saving 200 miles. Now and today, if you go up to Wyoming, you'll find a mountain, a pass, a city, and a county all named after him. So when he came back, at the, as the war opened up, he came back and he was given uh, a brigade of men. This gentleman, and this is something that, again, most everybody in here could never know this, that he is the only Union general, general, the best Stonewall Jackson. In West Virginia, he got into a, a fracas with him, and Jackson had to retreat. It's the only time that he's ever retreated, and it was against this man right here. So that's really something. Now, the other thing is this. He married a woman in San Francisco about a year, in 1860. The war started late 61, or early 61. So they were married about a year and a half. It turns out that his wife also was a very prominent person. <clears throat> she was known in the uh, world of the theater. Now, he was born here at Sa in Salem, Mass. His family name was West. His wife's name was if I can find it in here, uh, where'd it go? Anyway, see it. That's what I get for it. Shuffling papers. Is, anyway, she was known to the people. Do you know the name uh, Booth? Anybody heard of Booth? The Booth family. What did Booth do? Does anybody know? He what? He killed Lincoln. Well, there was a whole family of Booths that were in the theater at the time. And because of that, she was also in the theater and well known to both the Booths and all of the prominent families of the theater of the time. Now, she was born in, uh, in England, but moved here. Anybody know where King Street is? Kings Beach? King Street? Anybody know where that is? She lived, had a home, right off, right off of the end of Ocean Street. And, they, and she came here with her husband every summer. In the winter time and that, she was living down in Washington. But she came here to summer. This was, Lynn was her summer home 
that she loved very much. Lynn Kings Beach, you've all seen that beach, you've played on that beach, I'm sure. I grew up on that beach. I fished from that beach. It's really a tremendous, well, 200, 150 years earlier, she was doing the same thing. So she comes along and buys the house. They live up there. She sold the house and then built the smaller one that she lived in after her husband was killed. Now the husband was a very interesting character, as we said. She's now out trying to help the war effort. She's trying to work in a, in a hospital, set up a hospital to take care, not go, being very lucky at getting it going. And as a result, when her husband dies, she spends as much time as she can in, in uh, South Carolina trying to take and uh, take care of 50 guys. She rented a, 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 a big, I'll call it a big barn, but it was a big warehouse. Took furniture from her own house, beds from her own house, set it up, and took care of these men who were wounded uh, down there. Uh, the general, he's off at the war trying to do the best he can, and a day after Ball's Bluff, uh, the Battle of Ball's Bluff, he's in a skirmish and gets wounded in his leg. Now, if you heard earlier, we heard about a 58 caliber. That's a big bullet. That's, a, that's gonna hit, and that's gonna do a lot of damage. Well, he took it in the leg. It put him into a position where he had to go to the hospital. He spent a couple of weeks in the hospital. And back then, if you went to the hospital, I can almost say like today, if you stay there too long, you catch something else. And he did. He got pneumonia and died. And that brings us to the fact that he was well liked by President Lincoln and his commanding general. And they had a huge parade for him down in Washington, marched him up to the uh, railroads, and shipped his body back to Salem, Massachusetts, <coughs> where he's buried. He's in, a, in a grave over there that just has his family name, West, on the gravesite. And that's it. You'd never know that he was buried there, that he was a famous individual, well liked. And oh, by the way, he wrote poetry. Who would think that a guy that's able to fight Indians, fight in, a, in the Civil War as a really determined soldier, and then write poetry? And he wrote all kinds of great poetry about the Civil War in the short time that he fought it in. So it's time now to say thank you very much for coming. What do you want? Where, where do you want these kids to go now? Really? Yeah. yeah.